Welcome back to Time Series Analysis. Today we're going to continue with regression-based models, particularly the so-called global trend models, and we'll also do some examples in R just to get to show how you can do things in both, you can see, direct doing things manually, but also getting help by functions to do things. So trend models are basically linear regression models where you take functions of time as the independent variables. So if you have something that is growing st steadily over time, you can just use the time point as your predictor. That's, you can say, the long story short. So what we do is that we look at some observation. We have, say, observation observed up to time n, and then we have a relative time j, and then we have a function that is what we use to create our predictors that depend only on the relative time difference. That gives us the design matrix when you stack all these. And then, of course, we still to have a linear regression models. We have the corresponding uncertainty here. So that's the class of models that we're looking at right now. And just to do a small motivation for why to pick this where the time is relative to the last observation instead of just using the, you can say, usual standard naive formulation. So in the naive formulation, what you have there, if you look at the design matrix, you have all the observations, y1 down to yn, and then you have a, say, if you have a linear regression model, what you have is a column of ones, and then you have that this is observation 1 and this is observation n, like this. And then you have your parameter vector here. Maybe we should just to compare later on. We call these phi 0 and phi 1. And then plus a vector of the epsilon 1 down to epsilon n. So this is the traditional story. If we do it with this formulation up here in the linear regression setting, then <coughs> in the trend model setting here, the observations are the same, y1 down to yn. And then what we have as a sign matrix is again a color of ones to represent the mean value, but then what we have is time relative to the most recent observation, so we have time difference zero here at the end, and then we, we go all the way back, this is minus n minus 1 here, up here. And let's call these theta 0, theta 1, plus all the epsilons that we have here from epsilon 1 down to epsilon n. So the two models are giving the identical predictions. Maybe I should just make that clear y in here. We have the identical observations and identical epsilons here. We have different representations of the models here. So what happens <coughs> in these models? In practice, n will be growing. So that means you get a number here that is larger and larger and larger. And now what happens then? Whenever you're going to make predictions, your reference time point, say, the beginning of time, year zero, all of a sudden, when you start with something that is year zero down here in this corner, and what you care about is out here, then you will often have a large uncertainty on the intercept here that really doesn't re represent anything about what's happening right now. So by using the current time as your reference time point, then the uncertainty on the intercept represents the uncertainty right now. So that's one motivation for this. And that it also keeps the estimated parameters at reasonable levels up here, because if you have a slope up here, something that's supposed to be positive, if your time reference is the beginning of time, then you will have something that is effectively negative here. So you have non-meaningful parameters. Of course, they're still this representing the same model, but it's nice sometimes where what you have here. Now, another thing is the prediction at the current point in time is 
exactly just the first parameter. So it's easy as well in that sense. So the correlation between the two doesn't matter when you're just looking at what is the estimate at the current point in time. And often you care more about the estimate at the current point in time than up here where you have the mo least uh, relation between the two at the first observation. So since what we want to work with in this course is models where you can update continuously over time when you get more and more information, you want to have something that is efficiently when you're running it in that setting. Now, what is the link between those two parameters here? Well, since it's the same model, it's the same slope, the only difference is that the intercept is different in the two cases here. So the intercept down here, theta zero is equal to the intercept of the original model, model here, the phi zero plus n step forward with the estimated slope. So that's the relation and theta one equals phi one because it's the same slope. So that is the link between the two models. So they are very close, but just slightly different in a way that what the parameters represent. And as to repeat myself, for the trend model, you have parameters representing what you care about in the current time. So that's what I've just said. In a general setting, we have this expression here for the trend model. And if we just, as we assumed over here, have a linear model, then we have a one here to get the intercept. And then we have j to say how far different are we in time relative to the current time n here, because we do the time here relative to time n. Now, to get one step forward in time, what do we do? Well, your time step is now y n plus 1 plus j is just to say to use j plus 1 here. And then everything else is such the same, except the epsilon is, of course, also a new epsilon. So how do you get from this to that? In the trend model, if it is a true trend model, you have a time step or matrix that we label L here that in this case is a 1, 1, 0, 1 matrix for the linear trend model. And you pre-multiply that on the previous one, and then you get what you have down there. So the first one, you keep your intercept. You still want an intercept. And then you say, I want to have one more down here. And then it's gone. So this f of j here gives you, uh, so the L here defines you the transition from f of j to f of j plus 1. That's going to come in hand in, handy in a moment. But first, let's just look at selection of different trend models. So what we require is that we can get step forward in time by pre-multiplying L on f of j to get f of j plus 1. We have to specify, of course, an initial value for the linear regression model, it's f of 0 is just a 1 and a 0 as a column vector. But you can do many more complicated models as well, also simpler models. So the most simple model is what is called the constant mean model, where we just have a theta 0 here. where we prob And that means the f of j is always equals to, well, the only thing that's in here is one parameter. We need a 1 in the design matrix to estimate that one. So f of j is equal to 1, no matter what j is. We just look at the linear trend model. We can also do a quadratic trend model, where we have an intercept part, then we have a linear part, and we have a quadratic part. Here, we have not just j squared, but j squared over half. That comes from the Taylor expansion, and it makes the matrix L simpler to create. And you can do that for a Kate or a polynomial trend in the same way with the Taylor expansion. Now, you can also do harmonic models if you like. So you have a sign with a fixed period. And the reason is what happens when you have a model like that, what, when you go from one sample to the next sample in this case, even though j is inside the sign function here, it corresponds to a rotation. Each time 
you go f you make a fixed rotation and that's just a matrix that you can multiply on so all these models can be fitted within the scope you can find the f0 and the l operator transition matrix for all of these models in the book if you like 